Grace be unto you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a joy to welcome you to this First Royal Worship Service from the First Presbyterian Church in Pasadena. And it's a joy to be with you as we celebrate our fall startup and theological education. It's great to be together, even though it's necessary that we gather through technology today. There is good news. This week, we restart Brown Bag and Bible. Uh, we also restart Wonderful Wednesdays. If you haven't received an email from me about Brown Bag and would like to join us, please email me or call the church office and leave me a message with your email address. I'll be happy to send you the information to join with us. Also, you should have gotten in last Thursday's email blast all the information that you need to join for our conversation with PCUSA mission co-workers, Reverend Kathy Chang and her husband, Juan Lopez. They are currently serving in the Philippines. So via Zoom, Wednesday evening, we will be able to hear from them and ask them questions in real time, though real time means that it will be Thursday morning for them in the Philippines. If you need to receive that Zoom sign-in information again, please let Barbara or me know and we will get it to you. Also this week, the Mission and Outreach Ministries and Prayer Shawl and the book group will be meeting through technology and you're invited to participate in those groups where, where you are um, ordinarily involved. Next Sunday morning at, during this worship service, we will be celebrating communion so have your elements handy at home, a piece of bread or a cracker, a sip of juice. We will celebrate together the Lord's Supper. Also, next Sunday is the deadline to turn in your paperwork for our drive-through flu shot clinic. It will be held out front on First Pres under the portico share. You don't even have to get out of your car. Um, so that's, that's something to uh, get your paperwork in and participate in if you have loved ones who are not members of the church, they're welcome to come also. Just make sure the paperwork is all turned in to the church office through the secure mail drop at church or straight to NOLA. And she will take care of working out the stuff. You need to attach the information from your insurance card so that all of that can be pre-approved through our working with Walgreens. In the near future, we will be celebrating our 80th anniversary as a congregation. That will be a grand and glorious celebration on October the 4th. That day, we will also have a congregational meeting to elect elders and deacons for the class of 2023. No virus can keep us from doing the Lord's work. So friends, please keep on wearing your face masks and doing your social distancing and keeping yourself well and stopping the spread of COVID-19. This wilderness time will end and we will be able to gather together again like we want to. Friends, we have a special guest with us today, the Reverend Dr. Brian K. Blunt, president of Union Presbyterian Seminary and one of the finest preachers and human beings in the country. I will introduce him more fully a bit later in our service. And finally, I have a pastoral note to share with you today. Last Wednesday, Jimmy Gilchrist's long battle with ill health ended, and he entered the life everlasting. So we give thanks for Jimmy's good life, and we hold Donna and their sons, Chris, Jacob, and Josh, and all their family in our prayers. We give thanks that in life and in death, we belong to God. And now, friends, if you have printed this week's bulletin from our webpage, or if you have it pulled up alongside um, this broadcast on your computer screen, I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Let us worship God. Our God is majestic in holiness, awesome in splinter, splendor, and worthy of our highest praise. Who is like the Lord? Our God blew back the waters, prepared a path through the sea, and appeared as a pillar of fire to light the pilgrim way. Who is like the Lord? The Lord is our strength and our salvation. Let us sing to the Lord who triumphs gloriously. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. However, we know that God is both just and merciful, and we know that we can trust God to forgive us when we come before him with penitent hearts. Therefore, in that spirit, let us now bow before God 
as we use the prayer of confession that is printed in today's bulletin to pray together. Merciful God, we are quick to ask for grace when we fall short of your will for us and for patience when we stubbornly turn away from you. We confess to being slow to show the same mercy to others. We keep track of wrongs and cling to old hurts rather than offering the forgiveness that could free others and ourselves. Help us strive to be more faithful, Lord. Make us more loving. We kneel before you asking for patience and grace. Transform us, we pray. Pour out your mercy upon us until it flows from us in acts of love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn? Only Jesus Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ was raised for us. Christ reigns in heaven. And Christ prays for us. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Friends, I encourage you to share the peace of Christ with one another as God's forgiven people. It is such a blessing to know that our sins are lifted from us. With that as your motivation, reach out to those around us. Reach out to those that perhaps you've held a grudge with and not been in touch with in a long time. Or reach out to a neighbor. Or reach out to a fellow church member. Reach out to someone and share the peace of Christ. You might tell them about this church service, which they can view later today and be blessed also. But know that we live in the peace of Christ, and that's too good a gift to keep to ourselves. Amen. Today, we have the great privilege of having the Reverend Dr. Brian K. Blunt, a native Virginian, leading worship preaching for us. Brian is an ordained Presbyterian minister. He's the author of several books and a number of articles. He's a very widely sought after preacher and speaker, and you will understand why momentarily. Brian has a BA from the College of William and Mary, an MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary, and his PhD from Emory University. He has been the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary with its campuses in Richmond, Virginia, and Charlotte, North Carolina, since 2007. Brian is a noted New Testament scholar. He has a particular interest in the revelation to John. He and his wife Sharon have two adult children, and it is an honor to introduce Brian to you and to welcome him to our virtual pulpit. Good morning, members of First Presbyterian Church of Pasadena, Texas. It is a delight for me to be here with you this morning celebrating Theological Education Sunday. I bring you greetings from Union Presbyterian Seminary. I am on the campus in Richmond, Virginia. We also have a campus in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is our mission to equip the next generation of church leaders, those who serve as pastors, as Christian educators, as chaplains, those who work in nonprofits, those who serve in mission and ministry across our country and around our world. I am delighted to be with you in Texas virtually this morning as I stand in Virginia. The use of technology to serve this greater gift of our theological education world is something that delights me even though I wish we could be together in person and I wish I could be with you in your sanctuary this morning and especially with Dr. Fairfax Fair, one of my favorite people in the theological world. Dr. Fair served as a member of the search committee that brought me to Union, and she has also served in wonderful ways as a member of the Board of Trustees here at her theological alma mater, or one of her theological alma maters, the most important one, I would say. It's a delight to be with you and to be with her. Now, as we prepare our hearts and our minds this morning to worship, let us turn to the lectionary text that comes to us today from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, beginning with verse 21. Let us listen for God's word to us. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, 
If another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before the king, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay the entire debt. So, my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and your sister from your heart. The word of the Lord. So the first thing I did when I began preparations for my sermon to you this morning was check the lectionary. I wanted to find out what Christians around the world would be using as their common text today. What would other preachers be preaching from? What would other parishioners be listening to? I didn't like what I found. Now, that doesn't sound right, does it? Didn't like what I found. It's the Bible, dadgummit. You ought to like everything you find in there. Who are you to be saying you don't like what you find written in the Bible? I was talking to me, not to you, mind you. I was annoyed with myself. 
So I took a deep breath, cleared my throat, and regathered my Christian composure. Reread Matthew 18, 21 through 35. I still didn't like it. So I decided I'm not preaching on Matthew this morning. I'll preach on the other New Testament text. So I went to Paul's letter to the Romans, 14, 1 through 12. I like that even less. At least Jesus told a parable. I like stories. Even if I don't like how they end, I like a good story. Jesus tells a good story. Paul just tells you what he thinks. I didn't like what Paul was thinking. And I sure enough didn't like how Jesus' story ends. Both scripture texts felt like trick questions. I still regret the day years ago when I was teaching an introductory class on the New Testament with a colleague and we came up with the idea to insert a couple of trick questions. We were concerned that the students weren't reading the New Testament. Can you imagine taking an introduction to the New Testament course and not actually reading the New Testament? They were reading the secondary materials because they thought they were going to be tested on that, but they weren't reading the Bible. They were reading what people were writing about the New Testament, but they weren't reading the New Testament itself. So we had these questions where we would put in a quote from the New Testament and the students would have to tell us what book or letter the New Testament, the, the New Testament quote came from. That would let us know they were reading the New Testament. Questions like, Jesus wept. Shall I tell you where that text comes from? The Gospel of John, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew, right? Sermon on the Mount. Which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Parable of the lost sheep. Luke, right? Cleanliness is next to godliness. Come on, I've answered the other ones. This is easy. You tell me, which New Testament text is this one from? It's so familiar. It's right there on the tip of your awareness. Some students said Romans, some said Galatians, some said the letter to James. John Wesley preached it in a sermon in 1778, but not because it came from the Bible. He got it from somewhere else. The question is a trick because it sounds biblical. Christian folk use it all the time, but it's not in the Bible. It just sounds like it ought to be in the Bible. Let's put it this way. The students were not amused. Neither was I. After I read those two texts, they're the opposite of my trick question, the text we have for this morning. They actually are in the Bible, but it kind of feels a lot of the time like they ought not to be. I grew up with two brothers. Even though I love my brothers desperately, there would be times when we were growing up that one of them would do something that would make me so mad, and then my mom and dad would make me even madder. They would spout this Christian nonsense about making up and making right. Forgiveness. Bah, humbug. Mature, grown-up Christians like my mom and dad preach forgiveness. Immature, growing-up Christians like me prophesied righteous indignation. Mature, grown-up Christians like my mom and dad preach reconciliation. Immature, growing-up Christians like me prophesied eternal judgment. Yes, there were those days I wanted God to judge one of my brothers. Judgment Day, that's in the Bible, right? Peter asked Jesus the question I often wanted to ask my mom and dad. Well, how many times should I forgive those sinner brothers of mine? Commentator Tom Long says it well. Peter wants to know the statute of limitations on sin. Well, so did I. Jesus didn't mean forgiveness to be limitless, did he? But here's Jesus responding to Peter's question with what almost seems like a trick answer. How many times should I forgive a member of the church who does me wrong? You've heard that saying, do it to me once, shame on you. Do it to me twice, shame on me. In the real world, <laughs> you get to get forgiveness maybe once. Only a fool would forgive someone more than that. But Jesus, that gummit Jesus, what does Jesus say? I'm not sure Jesus is listening. A member of the church. Somebody who ought to know better. 
We're all Christians in here. We're all brothers and sisters in here. We know the rules. We know what God expects. We've read the Bible, right? We ought to know how to treat one another. And yet the, tr the plain truth is that Christians can be incredibly mean to other Christians. Church members can evangelically eviscerate other church members. I don't need to argue with you. I shouldn't have to convince you. Chances are you've witnessed it. Chances are you have been victimized by it. Chances are you have even perpetrated it. You've seen how wounded a person can be when a church member hurts them. You've seen how devastated an entire congregation can become when such hurt ripples out into the larger church family. How many times should a member forgive another member of this kind of thing? Well, first, Jesus offers up a trick answer. In the text before this one, verses 15 through 20, Jesus declares that if a church member sins against you, you do the orderly thing. You tell the person he has wronged you, then if he responds contritely, you let it go. But if not, you bring the church into it, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, then you treat him like a Gentile and a tax collector. Aha, that's what I'm talking about. In Jesus' time and community, we hate tax collectors, and we certainly do not consort with Gentiles. If we treat that sinful church member like a Gentile and a tax collector, that means we judge him unworthy to be a part of our community. We excommunicate him. That's day of judgment stuff. This isn't confusing at all until we stop and think, Treat him like a tax collector and a Gentile. Treat him like a tax collector and a Gentile. How did Jesus treat tax collectors and Gentiles? He ate with tax collectors. He consorted with and showed mercy to Gentiles. Jesus didn't kick them out. Jesus drew them in. Close. If we're going to treat people who hurt us the way Jesus treats tax collectors and Gentiles, that kind of means we're going to reel them in, not push them away. That gummit Jesus, that's a trick answer. Next thing you know, he's, he's offering up a crazy answer. How many times should we forgive a church member who hurts us? The New Revised Standard Version of the Bible translates what Jesus says as 77 times, but the Greek is confusing. It could just as easily translate 70 times 7. The exact number, though, is not the point. The point is that you should just keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving always. According to Tom Long, the whole process is focused on the restoration of the offender, not the revenge for the offended. That's the key to forgiveness, restoration of the offender. But sometimes, because the offender has been so offending, the whole notion of restoring him just feels offensive. After all, doesn't forgiveness reward bad behavior? My daughter was raising a German Shepherd puppy this past spring. German Shepherds get to be pretty big dogs, and they can look pretty, you know, look and sound pretty ferocious, especially if they're not properly socialized. And since they were bred to be working dogs, you have to work in play as if the play is work, and you have to try to do it in a way that gets her to be familiar around people and other dogs. So my daughter talked to the vet, to the breeder, to a trainer, and they were all helping her socialize her German Shepherd puppy. She used treats to reward the behavior that she wanted to encourage, and she used lack of treats and her own behavior to discourage behavior she wanted to stop. Now, no one wants a 40-pound German Shepherd puppy jumping up on them, even if it's because the puppy is delighted to see you. So when the puppy jumped up on her, she would turn around and walk away. She'd come back, and if the puppy sat as she instructed, she would give her a treat and a pat. And if the puppy jumped up again, she'd turn her back and walk away again. The puppy learned pretty quickly that it would be rewarded for containing its joy at seeing her. Impulse control, she called it. The vet told her to use treats liberally, that she was in essence for the time the puppy was in training a human Pez dispenser. Reward, reward, reward the behavior you wanted to see more of. Can you imagine if she would have given her German Shepherd puppy treats for jumping up on her? That would have encouraged exactly the wrong kind of behavior. Well, isn't that kind of what forgiveness does, Jesus? After all, 
Christians are the German shepherds of the faith world, aren't they? Incredibly smart, will work until they drop, fiercely loyal, they bark at sin, they howl at wrongdoing, loud of voice and larger than life, and their bite is definitely worse than their bark. Any church member who has ever been bitten by another church member can attest to that. So why would you give them something good, forgiveness, for doing something bad? What you want to give them is what they deserve, anger. There are these popular sayings like anger corrodes the vessel that contains it. So instead of holding in anger or hate, forgive, let it go. Now that sounds reasonable and rational, but no one who is angry, particularly in a situation where they ought to be angry, is necessarily reasonable and rational. Plus, we might as well say it. Anger is to a wrong what scratching is to an itch. It's almost reflexive. At least it starts out reflexive, and then it's something else. My great-grandmother used to watch you scratch an itch for a second or two, and then you got on her nerves. She'd tell you, you stopped scratching because of the itch a long time ago. Now you're just scratching because you like it. I think anger works like that, too, particularly the righteous indignation kind of anger. I've seen people rightfully upset, speak up, speak out, rightfully so, and then just refuse to let it go. Gone from scratching the itch to enjoying the feel. Psychology Today had an article back in 2018 that recognized this phenomenon. The title of the article was, Why You Secretly Enjoy Getting Angry. There are a lot of angry people out there in our city, our country, our world. And you can't convince me that they don't enjoy the anger that they're feeling. Perhaps something happened to them long ago, perhaps to someone they love, perhaps they just think something happened, perhaps it happened to somebody they read about in the newspaper, perhaps they just made it up, but they are angry, they are mad, and they can't let it go because it's become a part of them. Anger is like that, it gets in you, it becomes you. Forgiveness is not like that. Forgiveness is foreign. You have an itch, the natural response is to scratch. During this pandemic, most of us know how normal it is to scratch an itch, particularly when it's on our face. We don't want to touch our faces, but many is the time when, by the time we remember not to touch our face, we're already touching our face. An itch, a natural response, a scratch. Anger is normal. Somebody says something inappropriate, someone does something inappropriate on the highway, in the classroom, in the boardroom, in the church. We respond naturally, not with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a learned reaction, a thoughtful response. Forgiveness has to be trained, like the way you train your muscles to move in a way they ordinarily would not to hit a baseball, to shoot a basketball, to throw a football, to run a long distance race, to lift a heavy barbell, to throw a roundhouse kick. You have to practice it over and over so that it becomes a kind of muscle memory so that you respond with the forgiveness move you practiced instead of what feels more natural anger and righteous indignation. Forgiveness takes a lot of practice and a lot of desire. You have to want a thing to want to practice a thing, to get that thing. I want a six pack of abs, but I don't want to do all the core exercise necessary to get it, so I settle for a half pack. Question is, how much do you want to forgive? It takes practice to be able to build the muscle for forgiveness. It takes a lot of practice, a lot of repetition. So in a quick hitting situation, you respond naturally, not with anger, but with forgiveness instead. But why would you want to express forgiveness when anger feels so right and so appropriate? This forgiveness stuff just doesn't make any sense. Until I'm the one in need of forgiveness, then it makes all the sense in the world. Especially if God is the one I've wronged. I don't want God angry, at least not at me. There might be times when I want God to be angry with you, but I always want God to be forgiving with me, even if I have been justifiably angry with others. And that is why Jesus tells this absolutely outrageous story. He ties God's forgiveness of us to our forgiveness of others. Dadgummit, Jesus. The first thing the story does is broaden the range. It's not just about church members forgiving church members now. It's about kings and subjects. It's about people everywhere. Forgiveness is not just a church thing. It is a universal thing. 
Given the history of the European and American slave trade, the language of enslavement here is painful, yes. Jesus tells the story this way, though, because slavery was prevalent in his world, and yet, as you can tell, slavery in the Greco-Roman world, though despicable, was different from European and American chattel slavery. Greco-Roman enslavement was, for the most part, not racially based, but conquest based. Conquerors often enslaved those whom they conquered. The conquerors also recognized that many of the persons they enslaved were highly skilled, highly intelligent, or both. Conquerors therefore often employed those whom they enslaved as leaders in their business or personal affairs. Roman emperors were known to deploy enslaved persons as some of their most skilled counselors. It appears that this king in the parable did the same with those whom he had enslaved. They clearly worked for him. He clearly entrusted to them almost limitless financial discretion over his resources, which is where the problem comes in. One of the persons whom the king has enslaved has scandalously dis diminished the king's treasury to the point where he now owes the king 10,000 talents. How much is a talent? Well, a denarius is worth a day's pay. A talent was worth somewhere between six and 10,000 denarii. 10,000 talents is an outlandish amount of money. We would think of billions of dollars. There is absolutely no way the man enslaved by the king could ever pay back that much money. How in the world he managed to lose that much money is certainly a mystery. But it is a crystal clear thing that he would never manage to pay it back. As Tom Long writes, an Egyptian pharaoh wouldn't be able to pay that debt back. The king rightly scratches this itch with anger. He is furious. He is out of fortune that he can't get back. So he decides to sell the man whom he has enslaved and his entire family. The enslaved man and his family aren't worth 10,000 talents, so he's not selling them so he can get his money back. He's selling them to punish them because he is angry, and rightfully so. And this is where the parable gets really loopy. The enslaved man falls to his knees and promises to pay back every penny of the debt. We already know that it is impossible for him to pay back such a debt. It can't be done. The enslaved man knows it. The king who enslaves him knows it. The situation is therefore, laugh out loud, ridiculous. And this is when Tom Long says, the king must have been amused as well because he responded to this ridiculous request with an even more preposterous response. He forgave the debt every last penny of it and set the slave free. No threats, no recriminations, nothing, just extravagant forgiveness, pure and free. Extravagant forgiveness, limitless forgiveness. How much should I forgive Jesus? Not 77 times worth, 10,000 talents worth, a billion dollars worth. You know what Jesus is doing, don't you? He is suggesting that what the king does with this man he has enslaved, God does with us. Jesus is implying that there is humor in salvation. There is ridiculousness to salvation. We keep bothering with God about doing better when there is no way we could ever repay the ruptures we could ever repair the ruptures we have created with God. There is no way we can justify the wrongs we have committed, the debts we have amassed in our living. And we have the nerve to get angry with someone who does whatever they do to us when we owe God as much as we owe God. Jesus' story means to tell us that the whole enterprise is outrageous. Because Jesus means for us to understand that we are that enslaved man in this story. We are the ones who have been issued every day we live, every moment we rise up, every evening we lie down. We have been issued extravagant forgiveness. We reformed folk call it faith. And what do we do with it? You can't like what Jesus is implying with this story any more than I like it. You know what happens? This comedy all of a sudden turns dark. The enslaved man runs into another enslaved man who owes him a measly 100 denarii. 
When that person begs him for mercy the way he had pleaded for mercy from the king, he ruthlessly rejects the plea, responds reasonably with anger, and punishes him by throwing him into debtor's prison. Listen to Tom Long again. You can imagine the reaction Jesus' parable provoked at this point. Anyone who heard this story was surely enraged at the massive ingratitude of the first slave. And that is when Jesus turns their rage back onto themselves. This story, he says, is about you. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I'd like to think, as broken as I am, that my sins are not comparable to some of the sins people have sinned against me or others. Because my schedule often gets out of control during the school year, I write many of my sermons during the summer. The morning I finalized the draft for this sermon, protests had erupted in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and in other cities across the country because of the killing of George Floyd, the African-American man who died pleading for breath, declaring pain throughout his body, calling pitifully for his mama as bystanders pleaded with the police officer who had handcuffed him to take his knee and the full weight of his body off of Mr. Floyd's neck. I wondered about forgiveness as I trembled in fury over George Floyd's death and my withering inability to do anything about it. Death is the itch I feel. Righteous anger is the scratch with which I want to respond. Forgiveness feels foreign to me. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. On June 17, 2015, a young white man filled with racial hatred entered the Bethel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina and took the lives of nine African American Christians as they worshiped the Jesus who told this parable. On June 19, 2015, just two days later, I read these stunning words that describe one of the key reactions of the families of those Charleston Nine. They forgave him. So my Heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. There is much to ask Jesus about this teaching here. There is much more to forgiveness, to be sure, but I think the key point from this particular Jesus teaching is that for Jesus, forgiveness is not about someone else. It is about us. It is not about allowing people to keep hurting us or to keep doing the wrongs that they do. You will remember that the king in the story responded quickly and ruthlessly when his forgiveness was mocked. The person who forgives expects repentance and recognition and what follows change. Otherwise, the forgiveness is mocked. But with this parable, Jesus wasn't focused on what happens to the person who is forgiven. He was focused on the people whom he calls to forgive, us. And that is why he tells this parable, or as Tom Long concludes, when one gets a sense of proportion then, a sense of the size of our sinful debt and the immensity of God's mercy, no one would dare attempt to ration forgiveness. We know too well that the little boat in which we are sailing is floating on a deep sea of grace and that forgiveness is not to be dispensed with an eyedropper but with a fire hose. So fire away the very next chance you get. Amen. Friends, having heard the word of God proclaimed, let us affirm our faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 
Friends, if you are able to keep up your pledges, your tithes, your gifts to the work of God through the First Presbyterian Church, we're deeply grateful. Your stewardship allows us to continue to fund the critical work of our mission partners uh, and to keep all of our ministries going as well. Your gifts may be mailed to the church. You may place them through the mail slot at church, or you may give through the PayPal option, which is here on our webpage under the Give tab. Together we are the church. Together we do the work of our Lord. We serve the Lord, even when we are not together physically. Our offertory anthem today, sung by Marilyn Wilkins, is Sweet Hour of Prayer. She is accompanied by Ron Aulis, and the music today is recorded by Barry Webb. Now, friends, let us unite our hearts and our minds in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, eternal and everlasting, we are awed and humbled by your grace. Never can we deserve the love that you show us. Never can we be worthy of the tender ways you reach out to us. Never can we live in the ways that we ought forgiving as you forgive, seeking reconciliation as we see demonstrated by your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Hear our great gratitude. Make strong and unwithering 
our deep yearning to grow in our own graciousness and our ability to forgive, to build and reconstruct bridges among all humankind. Through your word to us, we are challenged. The example Jesus sets for us is daunting. Help us persevere. Help us never stop trying to be the people you create us to be. We thank you for your servant, Brian, for the gifts of communication you have given him, for the leadership he gives to students seeking to be trained to serve your church. We hold Brian and all those engaged in theological education in our prayers, knowing what a difference strong leadership makes. Enable us to undergird the efforts of all of our seminaries with our prayers and to seek within our communities those you may be calling to serve. O oh God, our hearts are broken with the death this week of Jimmy Gilchrist. We wish we could comfort Donna and their sons in all of the traditional ways, gathering and hugging and sharing stories in person. Give us faith to celebrate Jimmy's new and perfect union with you, and especially give Donna and her sons the comfort that comes in resurrection hope the truth that we will all be together again in your coming kingdom. We pray for those in our number and in our hearts who struggle with illness and with grief, for those dealing with the many anxieties around the reopening of schools, for all of us as we continue to deal with the frustration but necessity of meeting virtually rather in person. We pray for Bill, Mary, Jane, Joni, Roy, Melba, Lewis, Imelda, Rachel, Harvey, John, Tim, Ronnie, Fred, Joan, Adon, Ron, and their families. We pray for healthcare workers, teachers, and parents. We pray for those who risk their lives every day for our well being for those who are abused and oppressed, for those who struggle with addictions. Be with those who have chronic illnesses and with their caregivers. Grant us all patience, perspective, and strength. Pictures from the California, Oregon, and Washington wildfires are terrifying, oh God. Be with those who have lost everything, with those who have been haunted, who are haunted by scenes that they have escaped, and be with the brave men and women who are fighting the fires. Bless our neighbors in Texas and Louisiana who continue to try to put their lives back together after Hurricane Laura. We know that you alone, merciful God, can supply our needs. As we lean on you, enable us to be sources of calm, love, and kindness for all those around us. We make these prayers in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace, both this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.